Dachau, factory of horrors. Dachau, near München, one of the oldest of the Nazi prison camps. It is known that from 1941 to 1944, up to 30,000 people were entombed here at one time. And 30,000 were present when the Allies reached Dachau. The Nazis said it was a prison for political dissenters, habitual criminals, and religious enthusiasts. When these scenes were filmed, over 1,600 priests, representing many denominations, still remained alive. They came from Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, France, and Holland. Incoming prison trains arrived, carrying more dead than living. Those strong enough to travel were brought to Dachau from outlying points which were threatened by the Allied advance. This is how they looked when they arrived. Some survived, and when the rescuers arrived, they administered what aid they could. Others died after the liberation. They were buried by their fellow prisoners. As in the case of other camps, local townspeople were brought in to view the dead at Dachau. This is what the liberators found inside the building. Hanging in orderly rows were the clothes of prisoners who had been suffocated in a lethal gas chamber. They had been persuaded to remove their clothing under the pretext of taking a shower for which towels and soap were provided. This is the Brausbad, the shower bath. Inside the shower bath, the gas vents. On the ceiling, the dummy shower heads. In the engineer's room, the intake and outlet pipes. Push buttons to control inflow and outtake of gas. A hand valve to regulate pressure. Cyanide powder was used to generate the lethal smoke. From the gas chamber, the bodies were removed to the crematory. Here is what the camera crew found inside.
These are the survivors. Wenn die Idee und die Bewegung den Lebensausdruck unseres Volkes und damit ein Symbol des Ewigen, es lebe die nationalsozialistische Bewegung, es lebe Deutschland! Well, at that time, I was commanding a task force consisting of my infantry battalion of about 900 men, uh, an engineer company of about 200 men, and a tank battalion which had about 60 tanks. My mission was, uh, uh, my original mission had been to secure a bridge across the Danube River and to move into Munich as fast as possible. I was leading the advance of the entire 45th Infantry Division with that striking force. We had tremendous firepower uh, with the tanks, oh, plus I also had an artillery battery in direct support, so we had a tremendous amount of firepower and we could punch holes in the German lines uh, in a matter of hours. And. Um, so on the morning of the 29th, I resumed the attack uh, on the edge of Munich with a view of breaking down the defenses around Munich. I employed my tanks and two rifle companies to make the assault. Shortly after the assault began, I got a radio message ordering me to proceed to the concentration camp of Dachau and to seize it, seal it off, and to let no one in or out. Now that was not in my original orders of the morning, which uh, caught me by surprise, because all, all I had left was one company, my reserve company, I company, originally from Burlington, Colorado. So I ordered the company commander to take on that mission. Uh, and I told him, since I had not the faintest idea what we would encounter, that I would go with him. You know, it's a crazy thing. Uh, there was no doubt about it. Uh, I don't think at the time I even knew what the hell was going on here. So it was certainly none of this stuff <laughs> had been told to us. As a matter of fact, um, when we get to the, uh, to the town of Dachau, nobody had said boo to me about what atrocities were out here or what the hell was going on. I don't think they even told Sparks what to expect. We didn't expect this yet. I thought it was going to be a prisoner of war camp or something. But let me tell you, uh, half a mile, a mile behind us were all kinds of the press and all kinds of goody gumdrop people, what have you. And they knew, or they expected they knew, or they had a feeling. But they knew something hot was in this camp, and they knew something was wrong, and there was that. Was I had no indication of that. Well, you, the scene there robbed the human mind of reason. It simply robbed the human mind of reason. It was such a horrible, terrible, unbelievable scene that it was even difficult for me to think rationally there for a while. But I was thinking rationally from the whole way through. Uh, by that time, I was a, a real battle-hard veteran, you know. I had been in many, many battles, starting in uh, Sicily. We came in from North Africa to Sicily, and went all the way from Sicily to Salerno, to Anzio, to the invasion of France, 
I had been wounded twice, hospitalized for a couple of months. So I was used to death and I was used to combat. It was you know, part of my job at that time, but I uh, was not prepared for what I saw in Dachau. Nothing could prepare you for that. Nothing could prepare you for that type of slaughter that was carried on in that camp. And it's the most god awful smell you never want to smell in your life. And you know, you try to hold yourself together and you try to make yourself, you know, you say, I don't know, you're trying to tell yourself that you can control yourself. And I looked at my buddy, Bobby McDonald, and of course he had, he was just in complete tears. And so then I busted out. And I think looking around, I think most of the guys were all complete teary eyes. And I know our lieutenant was really upset. He would start really cussing the Germans. He said, as God knows what he was saying about the Krauts, you know what I mean? But he was very angry too. Everyone was. And it was, it was a very, very, I don't know. You almost start getting a savage feeling out of it yourself. You know, like you, some sort of way of getting revenge or something like this. And, uh, but still not knowing what you're really coming up against. You had still had no idea what you were coming up against. We didn't know if there was 10 people up there waiting for us. We didn't know if there was 100, 200, 300, or what. We knew there was guards. They said that, you know, the rumor has that there was guards still up there, and there was some SS there, and that sort of thing, they said. And, um, but these are things, guys talking and all, you really don't know. There's nothing official, you know. So then we started making our approach you expect to see many things on trains, maybe coal or cattle or wheat or lumber or almost anything. But seeing a train loaded with dead bodies uh, is a particularly horrifying sight, uh, and a sight that none of the soldiers uh, in the unit had ever seen before. I almost doubt if anybody has ever seen a train uh, loaded with 2,300 dead bodies. Unfortunately, the soldiers of the 157th, this happened to be I Company of the 3rd Battalion, 157th, they assumed that these people had been murdered inside the camp. And they became very emotionally disturbed uh, they decided whoever was inside the camp was responsible for the murder of these people and more or less decided that they did not deserve to live. And the word was passed to take no prisoners. People say that you can get hardened to death. I, I never agreed to that, although I could... Uh uh, I'd rather see a dead German than, than a dead American. However, um, I do think as, uh, as we went along in combat, death was a, and seeing dead bodies was almost an everyday occurrence. So I think we probably got hardened to it to some degree, but the, the volume of death at Dachau and the, and the bodies just barely skin over the bone and so on, which, uh, showed us that there was a lot of cruelty and starvation and everything involved was uh, overwhelming. Like I say, I attached myself to Blackie. He'd go in a barracks. He'd either shoot the guard or say, Chaplain, it's clear. We'd go into the next barracks, and then we went on down past the crematorium. And then we got down to where the prisoner stockade was. And well, things happened. We went to the wire enclosure, and um, there behind the wire enclosure were thousands of inmates, Dachau inmates, uh, who looked like uh, they couldn't even comprehend words spoken to them. They were all skin and bone. And uh, they had skull caps, and they had like scarlet, red, and white um, striped suits. And um, the thing about being in Dachau brought a special interest to me because I'm a Polish heritage, and the majority of the inmates were of Polish descent. So I spoke out to them in Polish, in which Calvin Sheets, the sergeant, can verify. 
I asked if any of them are Poles. And jointly, I heard so several responses. Uh, is, we are all Poles. And so I don't know if they expected me uh, to open the gates or liberate, the, liberate them. I wasn't sure exactly what went through their mind. However, I asked them if they would like to join me in singing the Polish national anthem. And I started singing. And it sounded something like this. Jeszcze Polska nie zginęła, póki my żyjemy. And I went on to sing the first phrase of the song that I was taught in the Polish Catholic school. And they joined me, and at the end they threw up their skull caps. They created a scene, and the MPs come. And uh, although the MPs weren't organized, but I was, we were told to move away. We're causing a riot. How would you like to be an SS guy, and there were plenty of them at Dachau, you're sitting there about this time. You've just come back from the Russian center, you've been wounded, and you've been, oh, whatever. And now you're assigned as a guard at SS, I mean at Dachau, or any of the other camp. What do you write home to your mother? We say, hey, Dima, things are rough here. You know, they sent me here after I got wounded on the Russian front. But uh, we make our quarter every day, Ma. But it's a tough life. Is that what you say? What do you say as a guy? I mean, you're sitting there, you're seeing this up and down every day of the week. How do you write home to your mother? What do you say? Well, I had been there with the 45th from the time we invaded Sicily. And then we, in, it, all through Italy and Anzio Beach and and into France, and I noticed that uh, even though I was uh, had just turned 22 on April 2nd, prior to the war ending, and in, in uh, our part of the war ended on April the 29th after we captured Dachau and Munich, and I I, I knew 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 that the the time was uh, running out on me. I uh, not, not not that I felt I was going to it killed, but I didn't think I could handle much more of it. I'd been there too long, and I, uh, like a lot of other guys, and, and I, uh, I, I, I thought I was wearing out. I, I just didn't have, and if, uh, at any thought of going to the Pacific was just out of the question. I, if there weren't in Europe and they would have asked me to go to the Pacific, I think I'd almost had to refuse. I just. I don't know what the consequences have been, but I think I would have refused. I'll be honest with you, I broke down. I started crying. I just, the whole thing was getting to me. Uh, this was the culmination of something that I had never been trained for or that nobody had ever said, this goes on. And I didn't have the guts or the balls to, to say, oh, you know, it's one thing to be up on a plane and down a submarine and have something shake up the boat and maybe the boat's going to sink or the plane's going to go. And, now you're in a bad spot. You never had training for that either. But at least there were some things you could do. But this was different. This was not a mechanical problem with a piece of equipment that you knew you were going to die in or you might die in or it looked like the end of the, the line. This was a personal people. My feeling at that time was when I saw all these people, their families don't know this. I mean, their fathers, their mothers, their sisters, their brothers, their children don't know they're here. And they're going to be suddenly gone, and, and nobody will never know what happened to them. What I'm going to say now may have been the most poignant experience of my whole time in the Dachau camp. I told you as we moved into this portion of the camp, no one was around. They were around, but they weren't seen. First of all, the prisoners in those barracks were so weak that they could barely drag themselves to the doorways. Keep in mind, those that could function were up at the main gate. OK, so now we're coming down the street very slowly, being very cautious and so on. And it turned out that the prisoners that could still at least move a little bit were in the barracks or hiding behind barracks, trying to stay out of any possible line of fire. Finally, there's one brave soul, a man. As I recall, he either came out of a doorway or from behind the barracks and started down the street toward us. 
True story, true story. But he was so weak that he would fall down and, of course, hit his face. It was like blacktop, as I recall, or gravel or whatever. But then he would crawl. Then he'd try to get up on his feet again and try to, you know, come towards us and keep falling down. And he struggled when he finally got to us. I, I'm breaking up here. Dachau, okay, the Camp Dachau. Let's go back to March of 1933. You guys probably weren't even born. March of 1933. March of 1933. That's when the gates of Dachau were opened. And Hitler went down to Munich and got the chief of police, Himmler, and took him up there and said, you operate this, we're gonna, we'll fill it up, and all of a sudden, you, you, you work it out. And Himmler was the first commandant of uh, Dachau in 1933. Hitler, I mean, uh, Hoover, had just left office. Roosevelt had just come in office in a couple months. And he, that's where we were at that particular time. And they started from day one and they're knocking these people off. Not as bad as it was in the later years, of course, but they did a little investigation early in the war trying to find out what happened to certain patients or inmates of that camp. But they were generally people that uh, politically were not uh, active with uh, Hitler. But that was 1933, and you say, where are they? 1939, we are not in the war. A boatload of Jews basically left France, came to the United States, wanted to unload them here in the United States, and the United States says, no way, Jose. They took off and went to Cuba. And they're dealing with a guy, I think it's Baptista, and of course Baptista's looking for money. He doesn't, he lets a few of them off that had some money, I guess. But turned the boat around and went back to France. These are refugees from Germany. Jesus, why the hell didn't we rescue them? Why didn't we save them? Why didn't we do something about them? I was out of high school a year or two at that time, 39. I don't really remember any of that stuff. Well, the camp was a mile or so off to my left. My left front was not in our original attack zone. But when we, we had ac very accurate maps and we, we found the uh, camp easily. As we approached the camp, which from the outside looked like an ordinary military post, like any military post in the world actually, uh, with a masonry wall about eight feet high surrounding it and a, an iron, double iron gate which was locked. But leading into the camp, or on one side of the camp, as we approached there was a railroad track and on that track and outside of the camp were 39 railway cars of various types, mostly box cars and open type cars, which they're called gondolas. Uh, when we approached the, those cars, we saw that every car was crammed full of dead bodies. And we saw where two or three of the people had strength enough to fall out of the car onto the pavement, which ran along uh, beside the railroad track. And their heads had been crushed in apparently with a rifle butt, and their brains were scattered around on the pavement. As we, we checked the cars very hastily, all 39 of them, and each one was crammed with dead bodies, both men and women, mostly men but a few women. We found no signs of life. This came as a, a very terrible shock to us. I then gave the orders to assault the camp. As we approached, uh, first thing I remember seeing was all of a sudden uh, we we come. You'd heard some sporadic fire going on, but not much at the time. And then as we come up, all of a sudden all these box cars, maybe thirty some box cars or something, box cars, and I recall in cattle cars they looked like to me. And of course, all of a sudden you realize what's there as you get up closer that these are bodies or what was left of bodies. So that really there was just a, a, a skeleton with skin on it is what they looked like to me. And uh, 
it, it was just hard to believe. It was just, it was, uh, it takes you back, you know, for a minute, and then you, you realize all of a sudden, my God, these were human beings once or something like this, you know, you think. And uh, then you, you start really looking, and because we first spotted the ones that were lying on the ground and were already out of the cars and strewn out of the cars. And then you look at these cars and you see them packed in there like sardines. Well, they had to smother to death, that many people stacked it. And God knows how long they've been in there. And I swear to this day, I have never seen it written in some of the statements made by people and all. But I still swear to this day that those boxcars also had all machine gun fire all on the sides of them. Now, whether it was done by the Germans there, or it was done other places or not, I don't know. But uh, as we approached it and started looking, we didn't really stop to take a long look because we were still, our orders were to go into the camp. And this was just as, you know, you're approaching, it was in the, uh, over the, uh, like a little river or whatever it was there, if I recall. But, uh, and, but heading in towards the camp itself. But Spock's come up to me and he says, well, let's take the company and I want you to go out these railroad tracks. There were a pair of rail, uh, rail, line of railroad tracks heading out to the, in the general direction of the camp. Uh, you couldn't really see the camp from the village, but uh, once you start out the railroad track, you, you are on, uh, on right there. And he said, don't let anybody out. He said, uh, these people are, uh, uh, have, it's, a, it's a concentration camp. I didn't even know what a concentration camp was. I had seen a, a prisoner of war camp in upstate New York, up near Shanks, where they had Germans in it. And I'd seen them in there playing soccer and all that kind of stuff. And I, I kind of thought it was a compound for uh, prisoners. And uh, uh, he said, don't let them out. He said, we get all kinds of food and uh, medicine and what have you coming in here behind us, and we're going to take good care of them. I said, okay, and uh, we start down these railroad tracks, and we didn't go very far when the first goddamn thing we saw was 20 or 30 boxcars, some open at the top, some closed in, and here are all these goddamn people in it, and you kind of figure, well, maybe they're sleeping, maybe they're uh, hungry, or maybe you, you, you soon realize they're all dead. And you say, what the hell is this? We had never seen anything like that before. And don't forget, we had seen our own buddies shot, some mangled, some shot dead, seen German soldiers, some prisoners, but mostly the dead, uh, all the way through. It was, uh, we had seen women and children in some areas that had been uh, uh, died from artillery or uh, something of this nature in the course of a war, uh, non-combatants and this kind of thing, all kinds of things. But Jesus, here we are. And as I said, uh, there was nobody to be f in front of us and the, and the Germans. Two, three hundred yards, whatever the case was, was, were Germans. I wasn't five miles behind the line. I wasn't ten miles behind. I didn't come up as a graves registration officer. I was on the line. And so were the, the men in my company and the other companies. And here's this goddamn thing. I'll tell you, you get pretty shaken. So we, the assault platoons spread out and they scaled the masonry wall. We did not try to enter the gate at that time because we, we, I felt that it would be, there would be some machine guns trained on it. So two platoons immediately went over the wall and I followed the right platoon, uh, climbing, climbed over the wall with my radio operator and my personal bodyguard. And that's, uh, that's how we made our entrance. Uh, as, we, as I climbed over the wall, I found myself in the back of some residential uh, homes, very beautiful homes, uh, uh, brick built, brick homes, uh, well tended, lawns, flowers, what have you. I yelled at the men to be careful of booby traps. Now at this time we received no fire whatsoever. It was silent as a grave uh, when we entered the camp. I entered the back door of one of these homes and cautiously inspected it. And I could tell then that there had been a very hasty evacuation of that home. 
because there were children's toys scattered around on the floor and signs of a very hasty evacuation. Well, of course, I knew immediately that these were officer homes uh, for the SS officers who garrisoned the post. I then concluded that most of the officers, or all of them, had fled just prior to our arrival. Whether the day before or that morning, I do not know, but uh, shortly before our arrival, they were gone. We then branched out, and uh, this was a very huge uh, post, had uh, dozens of large buildings. We approached those buildings with great caution. We received no fire whatsoever. And I concluded that the post was pretty well abandoned. But then I heard some rifle fire to my right front and a machine gun fire. I immediately went in that direction. And at that time then, after I cleared a lot of the buildings, I came upon, I could see then, a huge enclosure surrounded by barbed wire fence, so say 20 feet high. And I could tell from the fence uh, with the insulators on it that it was electrified or had been electrified. So if you touched it, it was fatal. Outside the fence was a large concrete moat which was filled with water. And there were a number of uh, rather vicious guard dogs around. And then I discovered what my men were shooting at were the German soldiers in the guard towers. There were about six or eight guard towers which surrounded uh, the enclosure on the far side of the camp, which was probably, the enclosure was probably about uh, 400 yards square in every direction, very, quite large, and it was filled with small type barracks. But these six or eight guard towers were manned by usually four German soldiers with, um, with a machine gun and rifles. And my men had gotten behind the buildings as we approached and were picking those people off in the guard towers. Uh, in our immediate approach, there were two guard towers r where we approached. And my men killed all of the German soldiers in those two guard towers. The German soldiers in the other guard towers, which were on the other side of the camp that we could not see, uh, we could see them, but they were a great distance away. Those German guards, who were, who were SS troops, fled. They took off. Uh, we then started rounding up a number of prisoners that were hiding in various places. But after the firing died, and the men also dispatched the guard dogs, we discovered that the fence was not electrified. That is, the power had been shut off before our arrival. I suspect because the uh, uh, operators of the power plant had fled. So there was no electricity in the camp. We discovered that uh, we could approach the fence without getting electrocuted. And shortly after we, uh, the firing died down, we, I, I could walk up and observe a, a number of these small barracks-type buildings inside the camp. There were something like 34 of them, or about that number, in a row. And between them was a large street. And just, oh, I would say five or 10 minutes after the shooting stopped, we could not see any signs of life in the, uh, inside this camp, which we, of course, knew then was a prison camp. But just in five or 10 minutes, the prisoners realized that uh, Allied troops were on hand because of the shooting, and they saw the, the guards. Uh, and my men went up and took over the guard towers and threw the Germans out, the bodies of the Germans out, threw most of them in the moat. And we took over the guard towers. And, and then the prisoners suddenly when they realized uh, what was going on, they came streaming out of these barracks. We learned later that they had learned through the grapevine that the orders for the Germans were to, to kill all enemies of concentration camps before they fell into Allied hands. Mm -hmm. Such an order was actually issued. 
but it was not carried out. So they were afraid to show their faces uh, because they were figuring it. They knew we were coming because they could hear the artillery fire the day before. So they were afraid to move if they came out of the barracks that the German guards and the guard towers would kill them. But when they, they saw us shooting them out, they suddenly came out and th by the thousands. I didn't really know whether there was 100 in there or 10,000 or what. As it turned out, there were 32,000, which sort of overwhelmed me, actually. Well, uh, I took pictures of the external view of the camp. Next, I went to the sheds where they shed the clothes, where they were told uh, they would just go in for a shower. And I guess most of them suspected that it wasn't the shower that they were going to receive. Well, I, I went into that shower room and saw the jets um, that supposedly were uh, to emit water for the shower, but instead, um, I don't know the procedures, but some cyanide capsules are dropped and instead they were gassed. After they shed their clothes, they went, went into the gas chamber, maybe a group of 100, maybe to 200 if they fill them in uh, tightly. There were a lot of screams and uh, eventually there was the deadness of sound. Now what I just related was um, by the, uh, the camp, uh, Dachau camp workers who are Polish, who uh, cremated the bodies. They, they told me the stories that, uh, that I'm telling you that I had an experience witnessing myself. Uh, naturally, I promised them some cigarettes that I had and uh, they told me that they would uh, show me how they go through the steps of cremating a body. They had a, like a, a fork type long handled uh, tweezer uh, apparatus and there were the two of them. One took the body by the neck and the other one by the legs, put them like on a stretcher, set them up on a stand. And I got various phases of these pictures that I had taken. And, uh, and, and then I have a picture of them as they're putting the body halfway into the oven. And I have pictures of the oven and the ovens in which the inmates were cremated. And, um, and I was told some stories by these Polish workers that in order for them to survive, they had to do the dirty work. After the things settled down at, at Dachau and things had calmed down, and I took a, 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 a walk down the main street and I had no idea where I was going or what I was doing. I was just sort of going uh, on a uh, excursion, you might say, to see what this place consisted of. And the first building I came to was a big red brick building and uh, it was well, well taken care of and the streets were, you know, were red, red, red brick streets. And, and I remember walking over and opening the door and walking into this immense building. And I said to myself, I can't, I don't know, I don't know where I'm at. I, I don't I know what this is. And, and I kept looking around and I looked up and I seen these big uh, vents in the ceiling. And I seen the, the gas jets on the walls. And, and I said to myself, I said, Christ, I'm in, a, I'm in, the, in the gas chamber. I didn't know I was in there until I, I'd been in there maybe five minutes. And, and I remember say, saying to myself that uh, this sounds like that, uh, but I remember it real well. I, I said, uh, I've been here too long. I, I've, got, I've got to go home now. I said, I've been here too long. And it was a funny thing. I said, I, I want to see my mom. That's, I remembered I wanted to see my mom. I hadn't seen her for three years, and that's what came into my mind. I wanted to see my mom. And, and I started to get the feeling that I could hear the people in, the, in, in, that, in that room, you know, when they gassed them, the holler and stuff. And there were a 
many bodies, dead bodies, inside the camp, just lying around on the ground. Apparently, they were, they were dying almost by the hour. These prisoners were horribly emaciated. Hardly any of them weighed over 100 pounds. They were just skin and bones, and they were both men and women, mostly men, but uh, quite a few women also. As they came out then, and they gathered in a big group, fairly close to the fence, as far as my eye could see, I could see these thousands of prisoners standing there. Then a huge roar went up from all their voices. It just roared, roared, roared. It was a weird sound as they roared and roared and roared, uh, shouting, shouting, shouting. Uh, and then I saw bodies flying through the air over their hands. They were passing bodies across this crowded mass of people and ripping at them with their hands. Now, just shortly before that, I had picked up a prisoner who was on the outside. He was what I call a trustee. They did all the dirty work in the camp, burned the bodies and what have you. And I had, of course, had an interpreter who could speak fluent German, and I said, ask him what they're doing in there. So it came back to me, the, my interpreter said, uh, Colonel, they're killing the informers. Well, that later I found out they call those informers capos. And each barracks, there was a capo, and he was the head guy. Now these capos were, for the most part, Germans, but German criminals. See, in the last year or two before the war was over, the Germans started putting ordinary criminals in Dachau, uh, murderers, rapists, and what have you. So the capos were German criminals, and they had life or death power over their barracks. If they didn't like somebody, that person was taken out and beaten, tortured, or killed, or usually both, both tortured and killed. So they hated them. So when they realized that they were liberated, they took revenge, and they tore them apart, believe it or not, with their hands. Then I went, proceeded on out to the building, and there was a pile of uniforms with must have been 35, 40 feet high, and I don't know how, how wide or deep or whatever you might call it. And I, uh, there was a big pool of water there. It must have been dug like with a backhoe or something like that. And, and I uh, seen the top of it was, it was all covered over with, gray, it was like a gray covering over the, uh, the water. And, and I kept watching, looking and looking, and I said, and then I knew I, it was, it was the residue from the from the uh, gas chamber from the pit from the the, uh, the ovens. They, they brought them out there and throwed them in there, and I, I knew, and and that that was the that was the real turning point there. I I just wanted to get the hell out of there and go home. I just wanted I didn't even want to do nothing anymore. I didn't I didn't want to I just wanted to tell them to tell me I. Was on my was going to go home because I I couldn't I wouldn't I couldn't go no further. I'm telling you this because I never told anybody that anymore. I I, I don't think I could have went any farther. And none of us and I don't think there was a man on the thing that knew what to expect. And some of those guys I had in my company were, had been over there a lot longer than I had, and they were older veterans and what have you, and had seen a lot more than I had. But I don't think they did, and I think every one of them was shocked, and if you, I don't know, as I said, I'm not a linguist, I don't know what the hell word I could call it. I'm shaking right at this minute just talking about it, and I didn't know whether I could talk about it. I tried to forget about it for years, but those guys, I think, were as badly shaken as I was, and as I told you earlier, we get on a little further, and uh, I started to cry. And I think at the time, that was about the time the Sparks came up to me. He says, Jesus, Walsh, get yourself together. What the hell's going on here? Well, I think anybody that came in after us were probably either pre-warned or had a sense or uh, had been told 
that this was bad news. I mean, you know, once you're warned, once you're alerted to a t type of decision, then you can say, okay, uh, I was told about it anyway, whether I remembered it or believed it. It's another thing. But uh, we never anticipated this whatsoever. We had never been told before we entered that town of Dachau or whatever. As I said, we patched up a German soldier, and my company did, and took him into this house, and these two old ladies went, and the medic took care of him. I'll tell you, 20 minutes later, forget it. We never treated a, a wounded German soldier that nice. Never. But up until that time, that was the way we did. And it, there was nobody. And I don't think there was a man that you've interviewed or talked to or anything that says, oh, that no, was just another campaign, you know. Well, it was no rough, no, no worse than the Schaffenberg. No way. This was out of the blue. And uh, I broke down and uh, started to cry. I just couldn't understand. If you think that uh, you were brought up in a civilized country like the United States, and here you are, and don't ever knock the Germans as far as being hardworking people and intelligence. I mean, they were at least on a par. When I was in school, uh, most of the chemical stuff that was uh, studied and used was out of Germany. And they uh, were an intelligent people, but we were. And how you can equate, think, or even uh, realize what this stuff, never mind getting you to join up and become one of the butchers. When we were in Sicily and took Camiso Airport, there was a German chaplain who was wounded, and I talked to this German chaplain. He was, I'd say, oh, 50, 55 years old, and he told me that there was one chaplain per division in the German army. And I said, well, what do you think about the war? He said, chaplain, fellows of my age know that we are going to be defeated. We remember World War I. But these young fellows that are following Hitler, you'll have and this was what happened. There's a big gate, and there's a German guy comes out of there. He must have been about six foot four or five, and he's got beautiful blonde hair. He's a handsome looking bastard. And he's got more goddamn Red Cross shields on him and white flags. And he looked like Howdy Doody or somebody coming out with all this shit all over him, yeah. And uh, my first reaction is, you son of a bitch, where the hell were you five minutes ago before we got here taking care of these people? I mean, you know, with your Red Cross armbands and all that shit. Well, everybody was very upset. Every guy in that company, including myself, was very upset over this thing. And then seeing this big, handsome son of a bitch coming out with all this Red Cross shit on it. And they started hounding him, and eventually he... Uh, jumped up into a car and they shot him, up into a, one of the earlier cars, empties. It was an empty car. And he jumped up into that and they went around and they shot him. So then we started making our approach then to the hospital. And our orders were to get everybody out of that hospital and clear it. And the lieutenant told us to clear everybody out of there. So that's what we, what we did. And uh, the ones on crutches and everything else. And most of these were, these were all prison, these, these were not, uh, prisoners they were inmates these people coming out of the hospital that we took out these were all uh, guards soldiers and people like that some of them were had legitimate you know injuries some of them were faking it to try to uh, you know they put bed clothes on to try to make it look like they'd you know, hoping it would bypass the hospital and leave them there and uh, so we took them all outside and uh, started uh, uh, checking them very thoroughly, and uh, first, a little bit after, oh, I'd, I know the lieutenant was very angry, and he was interrogating one of the officers there, and then the next thing we know, that Bobby and I heard this commotion around the side of the hospital, and um, we went around, and another fellow f follows, I think, uh, and I, I can't remember, his name was Bremer or something like that, but I know he was of German descent and his parents could speak German and he could speak German pretty fluently. We, uh, what we saw with the noise and everything, it was two inmates had this German guard uh, from the hospital there and were with their shovel 
beating his head. And uh, we were about to try to stop it. And this one inmate kept shouting to us and shouting to us and pointing to himself. And so uh, then Bremer said he thought he said something about being castrated here. So that's when the inmate dropped his pants to show us. And sure enough, he'd been castrated. And uh, I had to admit, the three of us turned around and walked away. Whatever happened to that man, I don't know. And all in all, we found something like uh, 9,000 dead bodies, counting the railroad trains. As a subsequent count turned out, it was something like 9,000 dead. Uh, all in uh, many in an advanced state of decomposition. So the smell of death was everywhere. Well, I had some battle-hard veterans. We'd have been in combat two years, about two years at that time. And many of the men became extremely distraught. Some cried. Some screamed. And others cursed. So before I knew it, they were they killed every they were killing the SS guards that they could round up. I got that stopped, but we killed perhaps somewhere between 30 and 50 of the SS guards. Now, that afternoon when I went back to take pictures, uh, my assistant and my driver and the first sergeant were all standing beside my Jeep in the center of the camp. And one of the German soldiers came running around the corner and we grabbed him as he came to our Jeep. And a 42nd Division soldier came around the corner right behind him. And we were standing not over three feet apart. And this 42nd Division man whirled the guy around and said, here you are, your SOB, and machine gunned him within three feet of where my assistant and I were talking. And I said, look, fella, what, you're crazy. This guy was a prisoner. Got to kill him, got to kill him, got to kill him. Now, this guy was psycho. You could look at his eyes. <laughs> I didn't make any effort to capture him. I let him go. <laughs> he, he, he wasn't in any condition to talk to him. After I came through one of the main gates, I was, I was in a Jeep with a driver. I heard machine gun fire slightly off to my left. And of course, I wondered about this because I was told that the camp had been secured. I also heard the, the burst of machine gun fire followed by the fairly characteristic sound of, of automatic pistol fire. And I turned toward this, the area where the sounds was coming from, and I, again, I, I stumbled upon what, uh, a, a, a terrible scene. I saw a long line of German soldiers, ex-guards, lying against the foot of a stone, long stone wall. Most of these men were dead. Uh, I have estimated that there were several hundred in this group. Others have disputed my observation. But there was a very large number of dead German guards, supposedly SS guards. Some of them were still alive. Uh, they, these men had been shot down by at least one or two machine guns. But some of them were still alive, and they were, they were pointing to their heads and saying, over and over again, the word pistola, pistola. I, I think they were asking to be dispatched by a, by a pistol shot in the head. And to accommodate them, the liberating forces had issued a number of handguns to inmates. And these inmates were going down the line of the of the mortally wounded soldiers, German soldiers, and shooting them in the head. Almost simultaneously 
with my arrival, the shooting stopped. I don't know exactly why it stopped. Perhaps it was because a new and strange officer had arrived on the scene. That's me. And they didn't know what I would do, and so the shooting stopped. At the far end of this line of fallen soldiers, there was a, a hot German hospital building. There was one person in a long white coat who I assumed to be a German physician and a number of litter bearers. And they were carrying the few German soldiers who were still alive into the hospital building. Uh, this, this was what one of the most disturbing and stunning scenes that I saw at Dachau because it showed our own forces taking vengeance on, on what were assumed to be uh, criminals or murderers. I seen an American shoot approximately 30 guys with a light machine gun. I wasn't standing 10 feet from him when he t turned it loose and killed damn near all of them. And that, I'm not going to tell you his name. And, and that's, that's as much as I can tell you. I, can, I, I seen that. Uh, that's the only, they say there was a lot, of, a lot of German prisoners shot in that camp. Well, there might have been, but I didn't, that's, I, I did see that, but I didn't see where some guy was supposed to have ordered 343 of them or 23 of them killed. I didn't see that. I, I don't even know the guy. He was supposed to be, his name was Jack Bushyhead, they called it. It was an Indian from Oklahoma or somewhere. I, I, didn't, I didn't see that, and I don't even know Jack Bushyhead. I'd never seen him. But I do know this guy shot these guys with a light machine gun. And I, uh, I remember saying, Jesus, we come over here to stop this bullshit, and now here, here the, uh, we got somebody doing the same thing. Once they were prisoners, they were prisoners. They were, uh, they were unarmed, and they were prisoners. You can't shoot them. You can't, you can't do that. That's, that's an atrocity, I'm, I'm sure. Well, I never like to see people killed unnecessarily, no matter what their stripe is or what they have done. Uh, and we did kill some people there that I considered unnecessarily. However, given the circumstances, I, uh, well, I'm sorry about it. It was just uh, one of those things that no one could uh, control. Uh, the, actually, the people that we killed died a much easier death than the people that they tortured and killed, as we subsequently found out. Torture and, and hangings and execution in various manners was a daily occurrence. So in a way, we were kinder to them than they were to the people that they murdered. But at the same time, uh, I never countenanced any unnecessary killing at any time during the war. We tried to take prisoners and treat them honorably. But that was one situation that I was just unable to control for a short time. Uh, we finally get up to the moat, and we finally get up to, as this is after going through all these shops and things, and we finally get up to the moat and the main gate. This is the main gate that says, uh, work makes you free. Some Arbeit uh, thing in some German, it was a typical ex expression that Germans used in these concentration camps. And by the way, the Japanese had one very similar. Uh, I think the Japs' expression was, work makes you free. Oh, no, the Jap expression was, work makes you happy. And the Germans was, work makes you free. Now, if you twist those things around the right way, you can probably come up with uh, some feeling that maybe they're right. And up to a point, they're right. If you keep busy or active, uh, you tend to know, don't get remorseful and brood about things. And, but that was the expression uh, on the gate. And when I got to the gate, I, uh, 
asked if anybody spoke English, and there was an Englishman there. I think he was a naval officer. He was, he was either English or uh, Dutch, maybe, but, but probably English. And he was a naval officer. And he said, I said to him, I said, are there any Americans in there? And he says, I don't know. He says, I think so, but there may be only one or two. And uh, then I said, I told him, I said, I don't want anybody uh, to get along, and of course the people, my guys are up against the fence, you see some of those pictures, and they were all yelling and screaming, and I said, I um, can't open the gates, but I, I, want, I want you to know that there's all kinds of medical supplies and doctors and food and stuff like this <coughs> coming behind us, and they're going to take care of you. And he said, I want you to come in here first before anything. I want you to see what was going on. And he finally prevailed on me. I said, OK, I'll go in. I went in with Bushy Head and a sergeant, three of us. And of course, we had to squeeze through the gate because they were all inside screaming and hollering. And he, he's leading me down the, in, in, towards these buildings. And uh, on the way, there's two or three uh, guys in, in uniform that are being hammered to death with shovels and shit by the inmates. They're the copos of the... Uh, what do you call it, trustees or whatever. And uh, they have them in every camp, and uh, there they are, and they're being beaten to death. And we go in, pass, it takes us up into an area where they had been experimenting uh, on high altitude stuff. And there were a lot of bodies outside on this uh, boardwalk outside this building, but he showed me inside this building where they used to take these high altitude tests. He used to put these guys in this thing and drain the air out, drain the atmosphere, all kinds of things, testing for pilots, for the, the Luftwaffe that went down in the channel or went down here, there, anyway. Medicine um, of that nature. By the way, if you've been reading the papers, the United States has been using some of those <laughs> records recently, and there's a lot of people who are bitching and screaming that they shouldn't be using them. But anyway, went there, went to a couple other, when the women barracks, and I swear there was women in there and a couple of children, but he, he's, we're making a real fast tour. And I get to another barracks, and uh, they're roughly four, four high, the, uh, the, the bunks. And there's, they're all full of straw. There's no mattresses or anything. And there's an old guy. If that guy walked in that door today, I think I'd, I'd remember him of all the wacky things. There's an old guy in a second bunk up, and he's reached out, and he's got a cigarette in his hand. And it's one of those, looks like a long oval. It's, it, it's a German cigarette, I think, and it's water stained, a little yellow color on it. And he's offering it to me. And the Englishman is right behind me, and of course, everybody is spearing out of their bunks at us and all, all kind of gangs following us around. And he, he says, I says, oh, no, you keep it. And the Englishman hits me, he says, take it. He says, that's the only thing that guy owns in this whole world. That's his everything. That's the only thing, a cigarette. Take it. Well, about an hour and a half after we had entered the camp, of course, we radioed back that we had secured the camp. And of course, 7th Army headquarters, we were part of the 7th United States Army. We were immediately aware of the fact that we had taken the camp. Uh, about an hour and a half after the entry, when things were very calm, I was standing at the gate to the camp, uh, a beautiful iron to the concentration camp itself. Uh, there was a bridge that ran over the moat and this big beautiful iron gate which had on it a sign that work makes one free in German or something to that effect. Because they worked those prisoners to death actually. Uh, just on stupid tasks, you know, pushing a wagon around that was uh, loaded with rocks or some anything to, to humiliate them. Uh, I was standing there at the gate talking to one of my officers about the security, and suddenly a party of three jeeps came up to this gate. Unknown to me, my men had uh, broken the lock off of the main game, gate to the post itself. I, I forgot to tell them not to do that, but uh, I never thought of it, to tell you the truth. In any event, they had 
opened the main gate to the camp, and these three jeeps came in, and they came up to the bridge across the moat leading into the concentration camp. And in the lead jeep was a General Linden from the 42nd Infantry Division. With him was a woman reporter by the name of Marguerite Higgins, who I think represented time, life, and I don't know what all, but she was a quite a famous uh, reporter, both in World War II and I think in Korea, and perhaps in Vietnam. In any event, the general told me, he said, uh, this lady would like to go in and interview some prisoners. She wants to interview Cardinal Niemöller, and she, and I thought she, he said the, the Prince of Luxembourg, and some, another name. Well, the names meant nothing to me. Uh, as it turned out, they weren't there anyway, but they had been there, but had been evacuated prior to our arrival. But in any event, I said, no. You see those people pressing up against that gate? I said, there are thousands of people there, and uh, they were right, right up against the gate. They would like to get out. If we open that gate, we have pandemonium on our hands. She cannot go in there. He said, well, she's going in, and I'm taking charge. Uh, and while I was talking, arguing with him, she got out of the Jeep, and while my back was sort of turned, there was a restraining bar on, the, uh, on this iron uh, gate that went into the camp, and she opened it. Well, the prisoners surged forward in a great mass. I heard them yelling, I turned around, and I saw them surging forward through the gate. I then yelled at my men to start shooting. Shoot over their heads, I yelled, and charge that gate and get it closed. So my men started running towards the gate, firing their rifles over the heads of the prisoners. And they got, drove them back and got the gate closed. Well, this lady reporter frightened her. She ran back to the Jeep. So I said, General, you'll have to get your party out of here. No, he said, no, I'm relieving you of command. I said, you're not my commander. You're from another division. I take orders only for my own commanders. And my orders were not to let anyone in or out. And that includes you and the rest of your party. Now get out. He refused to go, so the, uh, the argument got quite heated. And finally, I pulled my pistol and put it up against him and said, well, uh, First, I had a, a private standing there by the jeep. I said, private, uh, escort the general and his party out. So the private kind of stepped forward. This general was a, a dandy who carried a riding crop, uh, a leather riding crop. When the private stepped forward, the general hit him over the helmet with his riding crop. Didn't hurt the boy. Probably maybe rang his bell a little bit, but with a helmet on it didn't hurt him, but it had a good crack. So I pulled my pistol, and I said, if you touch another one of my men, I'll kill you. So that frightened him. He said, oh, OK, I'll see you before in general court-martial. But they left. He caused trouble later, a lot of trouble later, but they left. As res they immediately filed a report that the 42nd Infantry Division had captured Dachau. But that was the closest they came to it, was that little excursion of those three jeeps. He had some other officers with him, uh, had a battalion commander and some staff officers with him in the other jeeps. But they left and I never saw him again. After that, it quieted down again. Although within two hours, there was an officer me there from the Inspector General's department who started to grill me about the, what was going on and about General Linden. I told him to leave. But I had no time for idle gossip, and he got insulted, but he left. We ex went through an experience of lining people up against the wall, you know, and um, someone said that they were trying to get away, and rifles were fired, and machine guns went off, and several of them were killed. And you've probably been uh, probably aware of that, and I'm sure you've read articles on various type things on that. Uh, didn't really feel good about what happened there. But also, I have to admit, I felt 
there was a certain amount of revenge. And in a way, I felt that even though these may not have been the men who perpetrated this sort of thing, at least you paid back a little bit for these people, what happened to them. And I realized that they can't, you can't resolve it by doing that. It was wrong what happened there. But you had to have been there uh, to see what we saw. A couple of days later, we, they headed us from Munich. A couple of days later, they uh, relieved me of my command, sent me up to regimental headquarters company. And uh, I guess somebody thought that maybe some of the SS guys that died in their camp, uh, it wasn't a real legitimate fight, if you want to use that term, if there is such a thing. But uh, some of the SS guys uh, uh, had died in the defense of that camp. And some goddamn day, when I go to hell with the rest of the SS, I'm going to ask them how the hell they could do it and what they were doing up there. And if they knew, I don't think there was any SS guy that was shot or killed in the defense of Dachau that wondered why he was killed or wondered about it or couldn't figure it out. I think they all knew goddamn well right why some of them were killed down in the camp. Goddamn well right. And someday, as I said, when I get to hell, I'll, I'll check it out and find out whether they really understood. But I have a funny feeling that every one of them that died in the defense of Dachau knew why he died. And maybe he felt very proud dying for the defense of the fatherland and the defense of the SS and the practices that went on in Dachau. But that night, is when the realization really hit. We had to guard a bakery, our squad. And uh, I remember Bobby saying, I'll never make it through the night with this smell because he's smelling the bodies all day long and the stench and everything. And it was really the point of you were sick to your stomach to begin with. No one ate chow that night. We had our K-ration. No one ate. And uh, then having to guard this bakery with the smell of the flour. Everyone, just everyone, was sick that night. I know I was sick constantly all night long. And I don't think there was a guy that slept that night. And I don't think there was a guy that didn't cry openly that night. And uh, take a break from it, man. But I, uh, it took me a long time uh, to adjust myself to, I, I, to 1953, and I had a nervous breakdown. Then I, then I, I told him. And from that point on, I was okay. I started to get better, and I was electric lineman. That's a hell of a job to have when you're having a nervous breakdown. I used to be up on poles, and the sweat would run down over my face in zero weather, and. The guy was working with me and said, what the hell is the matter with you? He says, you, you I said, zero out. And, and I didn't know the sweat was running down over my face. And that's what was happening. And uh, finally, my, I think my wife helped me more than anybody. She did. I'm OK. I'm OK now. I've always been OK for a long time. When you've been in combat for two years and you've had hundreds of your friends killed, you've worked in an aid station for two years, you have either learned to close off your feelings or you become a psycho, one or the other. You just can't become emotionally involved day by day. It's not humanly possible. Maybe what they should do is in training, you know, they tend to fight a war today, uh, the people sitting back here, not on the line, but the people sitting back here tend to say, well, you put a Bible under this arm and you put the Geneva Convention under this arm, and now you fight the war that way. That's not the way it is, Jose. No way. 
you get into situations, and let me tell you, whether it's your buddy next to you that you've grown up with in your hometown, or whether he was a good pal, he gave you cigarettes, or he loaned you money in a crap game, or anything else. He's a buddy, and he gets a bullet through the head. Oh, he gets wounded, and he's screaming, mother, father, God. I mean, you kind of sets off a clicking motion, and you become a different person. Maybe what they should do in the United States, throw those goddamn books away and say, politics is a dirty, rotten business. And believe you me, it is. And I was a little bit involved in politics back here in the States afterwards, and I have that feeling. But I think most people will say, you're right, it's a dirty, rotten business. War, is, as somebody once said, is an extension of politics. If you can't settle your problems in politics, you start a war. So a war is nothing but an extension of politics. And it's a dirty, rotten business. And if you, you talk to an infantryman, he'll buy that. It's a dirty, rotten business. Maybe a lot of generals back here and civilians and what have you, and business people that think we should do it and all that sort of shit. But the guy that's fighting the thing out there in the front, he thinks it's a dirty, rotten business. Maybe they should train people this way. But can you imagine having a big amphitheater and saying, all right, now we're going to take Joe's wife. Now, here in the United States, we're training you for shock treatment that you're going to maybe run across. Get Joe's wife, put her up on the stage, have some animal come in and rape her right there in front of you. In the stage, this is training. And then you call Joe, Joe, come down here. How are you going to handle this? Joe comes down, he taps the guy in the back, and he says, excuse me, you're not supposed to do this according to the convention. Do you think he acts like that? Ho, 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 ho. Hell no. He'd pull a knife out or he'd punch him. He'd do something to the guy, I mean, he, before the guy even started. I mean, that's the reaction that you get in a situation. But they don't train you for that in the Army. You're supposed to be steeled, mm, nerfed, uh, so that when you go into these situations, these, this kind of thing makes no effect on you. Baloney. Strangely enough, my personal opinion there is this. I myself am of German descent, but I had no good feelings about the German civilians at all. They, Germany was the enemy. We were there to do away with them, and that's the way I felt. Still don't like them to this day. When the war was all over and we're down in Munich, they opened up an officer's club in <clears throat> downtown Munich. The war is all over. They're taking trips now down into Austria, looking at that stuff, and down into where the Olympics were held, all this stuff. And they have an officer's club there, and they get a lot of German girls to come in and uh, wait on tables and to, uh, if they had a dance, you know, like a USO, okay? But they were German natives. Hey. The ones I could talk with or you know, get across, they were so pissed off that they lost the war. That was the biggest thing in their mind, that they lost the war. They were hacked off. And I think when you go over there today, and I know the experience, that, uh, you, nobody knew what the hell was going on. You, you just, uh, nobody knew what the hell it was. It had happened. Even some of the people in Dhaka would say, well, I, I knew this camp out there, but I didn't know what was going on. Hush shit. Some of the people in that town took pictures of the refugees going into the camp, some of them were on foot, and they took them back from the room, you know, in the background. And what do you do if your kid was a, an SS guard in the camp, a private, a, a corporal, a sergeant? Don't you think he told his folks? And he was sitting there watching this crap going on. How can you do this stuff? I mean, how can one human being treat another human being this way? I uh, had strong feelings against the Germans after that camp. I had a lot of respect for them as soldiers and what had me up there. And of course, nobody could deny the fact that they were an intelligent, hardworking people. But uh, uh, I lost a lot of respect because of that incident. And quite honestly, I think probably you should forget about the goddamn thing. Document the best stuff you can get from the people that were there. Do it 
as soon as you can after the thing happens. Not 40 or 50 years later, like we're doing today. This should all have been documented from the participants and from the people that were in the thing at the time. I have spoken to a number of uh, high school classes and junior high school. Uh, my message to them is that Hitler came into power as a result of rather indifference to the political system in Germany. Although Germany was in, uh, as a result of World War II, was in a rather traumatic condition as far as the people were concerned. But uh, the message I pointed out to them, that you drift into these things before you know it. And the German people did not approve. I mean, most of the German people would never have approved of what Hitler did. But he got into power because of, uh, let's say, rather indifference on the part of the German people because he, they regarded him as a great leader. There were many people in Germany who opposed Hitler. They didn't last long, of course. And it finally got to the situation where if you opposed Hitler, you were put into a concentration camp <laughs> or executed outright, which happened in many cases. So I've urged them, pay attention to your political system, vote. The other thing I've, I've told them uh, is that this is not an isolated incident. You go out through the history of the world, mass exterminations have occurred under various guises and are continuing to occur throughout the world. Cambodia, as Pat Noel executed over a million of his own people. And that this, that this was not something that happened once and will never happen again. On a smaller scale, it's happening today in the world. In Vietnam, for instance, they killed a lot of their own people also. Anybody that opposed the, the, the present communist regime. So I pointed out, don't, don't think this is an incident that's behind us. This is something that can happen at any time, perhaps on not the same scale, but it is still happening in the world today, and it is but on a much smaller scale. We don't get much publicity about Cambodia or Vietnam, that's remote from us, but uh, brutal conditions and death are common there as a result of regimes which have overwhelming power. Hitler was more of a maniac than anybody ever imagined because he as well as others had to know what was going on. Of course, history has said that he's, you know, he ordered these things to be done. But of course, at the time you've gone in there, you know, all you can think of is, uh, you know, why can, I mean, after, after you've gone in there, rather, all you can think of is, why could the United States and the rest of these countries ever let this go on? And uh, because don't forget, these concentration camps weren't started when World, World War II started with us. They were started back in the 30s and allowed to thrive. And uh, our government, Roosevelt and everybody else, knew these things were going on. Churchill, uh, not Churchill, but Chamberlain, if I recall, was there then. He chose to ignore that sort of stuff. And so when you look back on it, you know, you realize that uh, an awful lot of politics played in war. It was people's lives, too. But the saddest part about it all is, you know, you, I can understand war and uh, even though it's, it's not the best thing in the world. But when you're, sh you know, there's a war between people and then one man shooting another man, hey, you see a guy gets killed, a buddy gets killed, it really hurts. You, you shoot Germans, you shoot any, any, any group like that when you're in war with them. Maybe you don't like it, but throughout a fear you do it. But God, when you see, go in and see people being treated like this, the human body being, you know, mutilated, starved, you know, and uh, so mistreated. Uh, you just, it's hard to believe that, that people in the government could be in their right minds. Because how could you be in your right mind and actually do something like this to a human being? Regardless of how you feel about it. 
whether you're prejudiced on me or anything else. And uh, I know uh, years after the war, uh, it was, I guess my son was a 13 or 14 year old teenager. And uh, he asked me questions, started asking me questions about the book because we had uh, the regimental book out one time. And uh, <clears throat> of course he sat there in fascination, uh, not enjoying it, but in disbelief. And uh, he said, uh, that's what he kept saying to me, you know, here's a young kid saying, how can they let that go on? How can they let that go on? And uh, I used to say, John, I have no idea. I wish I did. And uh, next thing I knew, three days later, he's got five school buddies in the house. He wants me to go over it again with them because they couldn't believe the story he was telling them. You know? So, you know, what was ha you know, you look back on all these years, it's, it's kind of sad because uh, what you're trying to do here maybe makes a point, but, you know, it's a point made way too late, you know, because uh, there's an awful lot of people have grown up in this country and other countries that have kind of chose to ignore that, what went on there and what's, you know, still going on today in some of these countries. So. History is a long story that simply repeats itself over and over and over again. I don't think there's anything different here than what happened at Alexandria when Pompey and Anthony and Caesar came into Egypt. Uh, this thing had been repeated during the Inquisition from the Catholic Church. It's been repeated when Protestants have gone to war with each other. To me, there is nothing different in Dachau than what's happening in Nigeria, than what happened 500 years ago under Loyola in Florence. To me, history is a cycle, and there's nothing new in this cycle. There may be different names, there may be different localities, but the basic human reactions are the same, century after century. We may hear more about it. We may think we are getting more involved with it, but the picture's still the same. I sat down with my father, who, had been, who was a veteran of World War I. He had fought in France in World War I. So he was no dummy. And I said, Dad, and I got him off to the side. I had a few photographs, and I think I had that Dachau book, which was published while we were down in Munich. And this was going on. He listened to me very politely. And quite honestly, I think what I was saying to him was going over his head. I don't think he could fathom what the hell the whole thing was all about. And he was a veteran of World War I. I don't know whether he was trying to forget or didn't want to un hear about it or what, but I don't really think he understood or uh, knew or could imagine. Probably that's probably what it was. He couldn't imagine this kind of stuff going on. If you relate this to what is now happening today to show that human nature has not changed, that these things that happened there are happening now, and if we aren't aware of them, they'll keep happening tomorrow, and that the next generation must be aware that these things are capable of human beings doing. Just like in Dhaka, I saw those lampshades in the commanding officer's house made out of human skin. They're doing it down in Africa today. They're still shrinking heads in Brazil. We need to tie the past, the present, and project the possibilities of the danger in the future. When I went back to visit Dachau in, in uh, 1984, I found many things that I, I, did, I didn't like. Maybe it was because it was in August and it was August is vacation month in Europe. The, the whole area was swarming with, with visitors, with tourists, who have every right to be there, of course. But there was a gayness, a gay uh, attitude among the visitors. They were taking pictures of each other in front of the crematorium and 
in front of the so-called gas chamber and in front of other places of horror and they were posing almost like people would pose at the zoo before the the lion's cage there were chapels there but there was nobody in the chapels where people might go to worship there was a continuous movie that went on forever and ever about the about the atrocities that had committed had been committed there uh, part of the camp had been had been restored but the restoration left it spotlessly clean as if it would have been a nice place to to live uh, in all of Dachau there was not a plaque or an indication as to what military unit uh, liberated the place there were many things I can't think of them all now but there were many things I didn't like and I came away with almost a, a greater sense of sadness than when, I w than when I left it the first time. What would I do to change it? I don't know. I'd let everything rot, I think. And I'd have a grass-covered field in which flowers were planted and trees and maybe one or two chapels with an eternal flame and I would have a memorial a bronze memorial to the first GI who entered Dachau on April the 29th 1945 his name was John de Groh and it would say something about the liberators and John DeGroo and the 45th Division.